It's another football Friday on News OK Live. I'm Mike Sherman, sports editor of the Oklahoman. Joining me uh, is our OU and OSU football coverage team from his home in Norman, columnist Barry Trammell. He's over there on the left. Just moved out of there. He is. Hi, Barry. I, I think from the newsroom at the Oklahoman. Is that where you're at? Jenny Carlson? That's correct. Hello. Our OSU football writer, Kyle Fredrickson, who just got finished with the uh, Power Lunch live chat. Where were you chatting from, Kyle? Uh, chatting from my uh, apartment in Oklahoma City. And finally, from his home in Norman, where uh, his Seinfeld collection is on display. <laughs> my Seinfeld. What does that mean, my Seinfeld collection? It's well, you. That's Jason. Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. Kramer. We're not already, talking about you, Barry. We already did that. We've already introduced you, Barry. Hey, we did. Uh, yeah, we did. You were. Well, it was nice of you to wait on me. We let off with you. We start at 11:30, buddy. Okay, let's start with this: Oklahoma State versus TCU, the game of the week in the Big 12 Conference. And have we been covering, and are we covering, the most exciting team in college football? Jenny Barry wrote about it. I'll ask you first. Well, it sure seems like we've got one of the more exciting ones. I mean, you can't uh, find too many teams that play games that finish on uh, game-winning field goals in the last 90 seconds, uh, in, in addition to a road win in overtime. Um, you know, winning by big margins is just not uh, something this team has done. And considering that it wasn't that long ago we were sitting through a practically unwatchable streak of, uh, of losses by the same team. Pretty remarkable, the turnaround we've seen from, from unwatchable to must-see TV. Just uh, a lot of fun to watch these Cowboys play this year. Uh, Kyle, let's just throw Dax Garman under the bus on that and, then get, <laughs> and be done with it. Uh, I saw John Helsley's uh, headline suggestion and, and uh, prediction for the game, uh, every week we ask uh, the writers covering the game to write uh, a sort of uh, visionary headline and uh, say how they think the game's going to go down. Uh, John Helsley, been there, done that. Uh, been there, done that really describes a lot of the climactic ways the Cowboys have won. Um, is this something you think that's really building and galvanizing this team? It sure seems like it. You know, we hear these cliches about, you know, leadership and, you know, being calm under pressure every year from every team. But, I mean, this squad has proved it over and again. And, honestly, I, I kind of think it starts with J.W. Walsh. I think that when he goes in there in these late-game situations, being a, a fifth-year senior, um, you know, everyone on this team trusts him and respects him to a point where I think in a lot of those situations they kind of play for him. And and we've seen it before, you know, maybe, uh, you know, if, if OSU fans see this game go into the fourth quarter and, and OSU is down, uh, you know, maybe 10 points with, you know, four or five minutes left, I don't expect this team to panic. And, and you got to, you know, as an OSU fan, you got to be happy about that facet of things. Um, but, you know, going up against Boykin in a high-powered offense like this, uh, they might have to score 80 points uh, just to be in it late uh, to have that opportunity. Barry, you uh, drew the card of uh, diving into the excitement level for the Cowboys. Do they play the most exciting games? What have been the most exciting games uh, in college football this year? Top 10 most exciting games in Cowboy history. You laid it all out there today. You can read it now on News OK. Also pick a copy of today's Oklahoma. What did you learn by doing that package? Well, I learned that, you know, uh, the Cowboys don't have the corner on exciting seasons. In fact, OSU's finishes are sort of pedestrian compared to a lot of teams. Brigham Young's won two games on virtual Hail Hail Marys. However, the consistency of OSU's drama um, four out of five Big 12 games have, have been just thrillers down to the last minute, or Case of Tech was, you know, a wild game, 70 to 53, and, and tight in the fourth quarter. So um, a lot of different ways to entertain people. Somebody asked, I think, I think you asked, is, is OSU the most exciting team in America? The answer is no, but they've been playing the most exciting games, I think, uh, in terms of the totality of their schedule. So. Uh, they can sometimes get boring, I suppose, uh, especially when they try to run the ball with their tailbacks. But 
you know, for the most part, they've been very, very entertaining. That's not boring. That's just ill-fated is what that is. Mary, let's stay with you on this question. Uh, Kyle alluded to it about playing for J.W. Walsh. Um, true or false? Eventually, J.W. Walsh is going to be the starting quarterback for this team. I'm going to say false, but I think he will play more and more. Um, especially if you watch Baylor K-State last night and you saw that the K-State was able to control the clock and move the ball on Baylor doing a lot of funny things with their quarterback run game. So I think you'll see, uh, you know, the, no one really plays like that, but the Cowboys come the closest with J.W. Walsh. So um, I think you're going to see some more and more of J.W. both tomorrow and as the Cowboys progress during this Big 12 season. Kyle, what about it? Uh, will Walsh be the starter eventually this season? He's muted what? right now. Sorry, I'm was, on, was on mute. Sorry, guys. Um, no, I agree with Barry. I don't think that J.W. Walsh's play, while it has been spectacular, especially in terms of his efficiency, necessarily warrants a quarterback change. And, you know, you got to think in, at some level, it's simply to keep Mason happy. They know this is the, this guy is their future. They have to think about the next couple of years, you know, and who's going to quarterback this team. Because, you know, there's a chance that J.W. Walsh gets that extra year with a medical red shirt. Um, it's something I'll be diving into soon once I kind of figure out a few more things about how this process works. Uh, but I can't imagine it's going to be the case. This seems like a guy who's destined for coaching, and and after this year, you know, he'll probably embark on that path. So I don't see it happening. Um, but like Barry uh, said, you know, as we as OSU goes against some of these teams that have that have shown some struggles against a running quarterback, I think you got to go to Walsh in those situations, and until those teams can shut him down. Um, thankfully for the Cowboys, if teams are able to do that. You know, they have another quarterback they trust to throw in a, a change of pace and, and, you know, attack teams in multiple ways uh, and trying to get wins here down the stretch. Hey, guys, it's not just about Mason Rudolph's mindset in my mind. It's also about J.W. Walsh's health. Yeah. Let's not forget that this is a guy that when he's been a starter, he's become an injured starter who's been on the sidelines. And so while this uh, specialty package for J.W. Walsh has been working out great for the Cowboys, it's also been working out great for J.W. Walsh. He's exposed a lot less. Um, as the starter, he becomes much more predictable uh, because I think teams know that his passing is suspect enough that he's probably going to run the ball, and that's left him vulnerable to injury. So he's stayed healthier. He's stayed more productive for not only himself but for this team. To me, this is the perfect setup for team and individual, I don't know why they'd change it. It seems like to me that it, it's working pretty well right now. I don't know why you would go with J.W. Walsh as the starter. I'll put Jenny down for a false, but just to 11 things out, I'll bring in Jason Kersey, the Norman chapter president of the J.W. Walsh fan club. Yes. <laughs> why? All he does is win. I mean, that's, that's all he does. He's a winner. And I, I like the way he plays, and I think he uh, I think he should be the starter. Mason Rudolph hasn't really done much to uh, Buster. Uh, Buster. It's hard to take listen. you seriously with he a must, dog filling he, half the screen, Jason. He, he he ran away. He doesn't agree with me. He thinks Mason Rudolph should be the starter. But I like I've always <laughs> liked J.W. Walsh. I've liked him since he first started playing a lot a few years ago, and uh, and uh, it, it seems like every time he's in the game, something good happens. If you like him, you want him as a reserve. You don't want him as the starter because, like I said, if he well, starts, he gets you, hurt. You know who else they used to say that about, Jenny? Jason White. And then he won this little thing called the Heisman. You know, Ooh. the problem with that is he, it's, it's a, he's a guy that when he was hurt, he's still a pocket passer. He's a guy that can stand in the, in the backfield and make plays. J.W. Walsh to make plays has to get out into the open space and leave himself vulnerable to tackles. To me, that's the difference. He's never going to be a pocket passer, and if he is, it's not going to turn out very well for his team. So I think that's the difference in style between a J.W. Walsh and a, and a Jason White. You're right, Jason. He, Jason White did become the Heisman winner after injury, but he wasn't a runner uh, when he won the Heisman, and I just don't see – J.W. Walsh becoming a pocket passer like Jason White was. 
And I'll say this. I, I hope that Jason's uh, J.W. Walsh's Heisman campaign is more successful than OSU's uh, Emmanuel Ogba All-American campaign. Let's, <laughs> wow. let's, let's, see, let's, see, let's see if you can't promote him a little better. Huh? I'll start issuing my own press releases. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, what did you say, what did you think about that t- today? Or yes, last night when OSU came out with a, uh, a, a, a press release or email sort of uh, aghast, uh, to use your word, that Emmanuel Ogba is not uh, – not getting any Lombardi love. Well, I mean, I I feel for OSU. I know they're frustrated, and I know they feel like Emmanuel Ogba is one of the best players in the country, and we certainly think he is. I think he's going to be the Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year. But I've blogged about this. I mean, when your schedule in the conference is backloaded and you don't play anybody in the non-conference, how are you going to get anybody nationally to get excited about you? It's not going to happen. So... Everybody thinks that uh, this this, uh, penchant for scheduling non-conference, everybody thinks it doesn't have ramifications. Well, it has ramifications. It hurts you in the committee room of the college football playoff. It hurts your players when it comes to national awards. So go ahead and play Central Michigan, Central Arkansas, and UTSA. Just don't come to me when you got uh, your players uh, omitted from national award lists. Don't cry for me. Argentina, don't pick J.W. Walsh to be on the bench when the game starts. That's my point. I think uh, eventually there will be a time when Jada, when OSU has to ask itself what its best quarterback uh, is, who his best quarterback is, and take a look at it, put him on the field, uh, maybe even to start and finish games. Okay, next question, guys. Uh, Kyle alluded to this. Uh, first team to 60 wins. Is that the kind of game we're going to see in Stillwater on Saturday, Barry? Seems a little high. Um, you know, if you don't, uh, one way you get a lot of points is turnovers. So, you know, OSU Tech was got a little goofy. I mean, I think I think 45 will probably win tomorrow, but I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to uh, be able to be too comfortable trying to win at 41. So. Uh, I don't think – I doubt we see a 50-point game, but I think it's going to be high scoring. Kyle, can OSU's defense uh, tap the brakes on TCU's offense? Oh, I, you know, I, if, I think if they can force Boykin into situations where he's uncomfortable throughout the game, I think they have a chance because, you know, as we saw, you know, last Thursday in that West Virginia game – even when you give him a little bit of time or you allow him to get outside the pocket with a clear lane, I mean, this guy's unstoppable. Um, So it has to start there. It has to start by making him uncomfortable, uh, forcing him into bad decisions um, and going from there. Because if the Cowboys can't do that, I think there's no chance they win this game. Janie, you got this in a wild shootout a la OSU Tech, or do you see uh, some more reasonable football being played in Stillwater Saturday? Uh, I got the game in the uh, upper 30s in my prediction, and I could see it going into the low 40s. But, I, yeah, I don't think it's going to get crazy. Um, you know, Gary Patterson coaches a pretty good defensive squad most of the time. Now, they've had injuries. That's one sort one thing that's sort of been um, forgotten as they've played better and better. Um, but, you know, obviously these are the these are guys, a lot of them playing on this TCU defense that – you know, weren't their better guys when the season started. So you wonder how are they going to fare, uh, especially against that OSU wide receiver group. Um, and, and I do think that OSU's defense, especially the front seven, even if Jimmy Bean is unavailable, and it sounds like he probably will be, um, Ogba is going to be a challenge. The defensive tackles are going to be a challenge. And then I think the OSU linebacker, linebacking group may be where the uh, focus is greatest on Saturday because – Boykin's probably going to escape the pocket, uh, you know, whether it's pressure or him making that decision. So those linebackers are going to have to make good decisions out there on the field, when to contain, when to go after him, uh, you know, who to cover, where to cover, all those sorts of things. I think that's going to be really important. Obviously, the secondary is under pressure, but to me, it's the linebackers. What do you do with Boykin once he escapes, once he takes off? How do you contain him? I think those linebackers are going to have to play really well on Saturday. Barry, last OSU question. Uh, this game really uh, going, uh, looking at it on the schedule, sort of shaped up as a battle of offensive coordinators, the one Gundy picked over the one he uh, over, uh, overlooked or passed on. 
uh, former teammate Doug Meacham against Mike Yurcich. Um, in the past, uh, Mike Yurcich really has been sort of on the hot seat. What's the temperature of his seat right now? Looks pretty cool to me. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I thought he had his best game ever um, Saturday at Lubbock. All kinds of trinkets and, and uh, gizmos. He tried it out to move the ball. You know, Yersich uh, suffers from two things. One, um, he suffered from some quarterback instability and offensive line problems the last two years. You know, nobody really should have an issue with his 2013 offense. They were very good. But the last year and a half, offensive line struggles, couldn't protect the quarterback a year ago, can't run the ball this year. Uh, and self-admittedly by Mike Gundy, his head coach keeps, the, keeps his thumb on him in a lot of ways. Well, Gundy took the thumb off against Tech. Gersuch had a big day, so I think he's I think he's doing a solid job. Um, you know, I, it, Meacham looks great running that air raid uh, with TCU, but you know, I think I think Gersuch is in is in fine shape. Let's flip over to OU Iowa State. Jason, Iowa State shut out the Longhorns last week, and uh, there's that 24-17 loss to Texas still hanging over OU. Which of those two outcomes is harder to uh, explain? It's definitely the uh, 24-17 game. I don't, I don't even think it's a question because uh, Texas is a bad team. It should come as no surprise that they would get shut out 24 to nothing at Iowa State. Uh, I think the much bigger surprise is that somehow that t this OU team, which I think is really good, especially on offense, managed to lose to Texas. Uh, so to me, it's really not even close. Barry, you were there. Have you come up with a uh, plausible explanation for 24-17? Yes. Um, I truly don't believe that the Sooners put pads in their shoulders, pads. I think they were playing with bare shoulders. <laughs> That's what a football team looks like when, you have play when you're playing rugby and the other team's playing football. Uh, they've got the big physical advantage on you. So Texas, which, what, what, J.K., what would you say, Texas, what was your description of Texas? They're a bad team. Bad team. He's been way too nice. They stink. <laughs> Texas stinks. And here's what, here's, what, uh, here's what OU did. They just went down there and didn't play. They did not play. So that game was nothing about Texas. 0% about Texas. It's 100% about Oklahoma. If the Sooners go 11-1 and one and miss the college football playoff and a two-loss team gets in ahead of them, the Sooners have zero, zero complaints. Jenny, do or, you if think a, or if an undefeated Memphis gets in ahead of them, they have zero complaints. I absolutely, think. absolutely. Jenny, do you think it comes to that? Do you think this OU football team is good enough to have the Texas specter hanging over its head, or is it just some, or it just be a pebble in the pond when the seat when we look back on the season? Well, I mean, I think OU can make it look uh, less uh, less like a rock in the stream and more like a pebble by winning, uh, you know, everything this month and and showing dominance. I mean, they're obviously going to have a three game stretch here beginning next week at Baylor then TCU, then at OSU. And if you win those three and you win them, you know, without much question, you know, let's say they win by, you know, 8, 10, 12, 14 points all those games. I mean, or, or two of the three even. That sort of says, hey, wait a second. Uh, this is a pretty dominant team. Nobody else is going to have that kind of closing argument. But clearly, if the selection committee is looking at you know, other one loss teams and you're saying, OK, uh, here's uh, here's Alabama lost to Ole Miss. Here's, uh, you know, Ohio State, Michigan State likely losing to one or the other. Um, you know, you start to look at some of those losses and that Texas loss looks like, you know, a really, really uh, ugly loss. I mean, that's a black mark unlike anything else on anybody's schedule. I mean, the name is nice. But it doesn't take too much digging to find out this is not the Texas team of old. And you're talking about, you know, losses to teams that are either you know, undefeated or, you know, one or two losses themselves and those other teams' resumes. resumes. So clearly, I mean, it, it looks bad and it looked even worse last week when uh, when that Ohio or that uh, Iowa State game was happening. I mean, well, that was just that was just a mess for OU to see what Texas did there. 
The one thing I would say in OU's defense, though, is that last year, if you were looking at worse losses, you wouldn't have put Ohio State in the playoff. You would have put TCU or Baylor in the playoff uh, because the loss to Virginia Tech was horrible, and Ohio State made up for it with dominating performances uh, at the end of the season. So I right. think that bodes well for OU. They have a chance to do that. Well, no, no, well but the problem with that is OU's going to lose any tiebreaker with a 12-1 and team. So they're they're going to be they're going to be judged against eleven and one teams. Yeah. If, if they're in the if they're in and then and then that Texas loss does become more of a factor. Is that the uh, okay? So let's will we be talking about the Texas game all year long, Jason? Is that uh, we just got to come to grips with this? This is the game we'll be talking about all year long. I mean, of course, I think we will. Because the more OU dominates and the better they play, particularly if they go beat Baylor, TCU, and Oklahoma State, uh, it's just going to make people ask more, what the heck happened in Dallas that day? Because it makes no sense. Okay, which makes more sense, Jenny? Baker Mayfield for the Heisman or Baker Mayfield for the Burlesworth Award? (laughs) Well, we probably better explain the Burlesworth. That's the walk-on award, the the nation's best walk-on. I don't know. I mean, I th- I think I think Baker Mayfield as a walk on is a little bit weird, but he was a walk on. Let's be honest, he was a walk on to Texas Tech. Um, yeah, you can't get past that. He didn't get any offers, and he was a walk on who won the job at Tech, and now he wins it again at OU. Clearly, that's 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 the criteria. I think you know. Here's the deal, guys. If OU runs the runs the uh, runs the month of November, if they win out. He's going to be in the conversation for Heisman. He just is. I, I mean, I don't think they can win out with him playing without him playing really well. Um, they don't have an offensive line, despite what we've seen these last few weeks. They don't have an offensive line that's good enough to really pound the football. I, you know, I would love to say that they're going to be able to do that against Sean Oakman and Baylor's defense or Emmanuel Ogba and OSU's defense, but I just don't see it. I think they're going to have to throw it. And, you know, I think that means Baker Mayfield's going to have to make some plays. And if he if he makes some plays and they win those games, to me, he's going to be in the Heisman conversation. I don't know if I answered the question, Sherm, but, I mean, I think he's going to be in the Heisman conversation if they run the table. So I don't think that's crazy at all. Very Jenny points out, Baker Mayfield's not exactly what the folks who invented the Burlesworth Award had in mind when they uh, wanted to celebrate walk-ons. Is, it a, is he a legitimate candidate? Well, as a longtime expert of the Burlesworth Award, I mean, I've known about it for literally four days, <laughs> and that Friday is the fourth day, so it's actually, I've known about it for about 74 hours. Huh. It doesn't seem like it's in the spirit of what they, what they were looking for here. Um, however, uh, if you don't lie, if you want something omitted, you need to make it a rule. I, I don't believe in unwritten rules, so... Heck, but I don't even know who's else out there. For all I know, there's all kinds of guys scoring 20 touchdowns and getting eight sacks that were walk-ons too. Um, but he's clearly been a fantastic player and eligible for just about anything you want to make him eligible for. But um, sometimes we talk about, you know, t- sort of like when we talk about Ogba and who's who's the best defensive ends in the nation. We don't have any idea how good the guy at Penn State or Texas A&M are, so. Uh, let's not try to be experts on things we're not. Jason, Barry's got a point. However, he's got two, he's a two-time walk-on, not a one-time walk-on, a two-time walk-on. And Um, he's a potential Heisman candidate. So, I mean, let there be another walk-on who rears his head and says, pick me. But right now, Baker Mayfield looks like the best Current or former walk-on that we know of? I'm I'm sorry. Uh, I was get I was getting a call on my phone as you were asking that question. So what was that again? I oh, I just to said it. Make, Makefield's a two-time walk-on. Now, doesn't that qualify him? I mean, I, yeah, I would think so. Uh, but as far as the Heisman goes, uh, it is interesting to look. His numbers are very similar to what. Uh, Jason White's and Sam Bradford's were uh, in their Heisman seasons. 
uh, at this point uh, in those seasons. Uh, so that's interesting. But I think the Heisman is going to be uh, Boykin or Fournette. It, it, you know, I, I think it would really be difficult for anybody to, to pass those guys. And let, I mean, I guess if Mayfield beats Boykin and beats him badly, then, then that would be possible. But those seem like the pretty clear front runners right now. Barry, well, guys, guys, Boykin could be out of the Heisman race Saturday night. I mean, when you start playing the big games, if you don't perform, you're yeah. gone. Yeah. So, I mean, Brandon Whedon was a, nobody remembers Brandon Whedon was a high camp uh, Heisman candidate until get up to Ames that fateful night. So yeah. you go out quick. Uh, could Leonard Fournette go out quick? I mean, he's facing Alabama on Saturday night. Would would that would it hold uh, on him? Well, it's. It's harder for a tailback to go out like that. However, if he goes 21 carries 47 yards, yeah. I think I think uh, that doesn't bode well for his Heisman campaign. But you know yeah. what? I think, and I think Baker they... Mayfield played really bad against Texas, so I mean uh, yeah. that that very well could disqualify him if you want to. Although I, that. although I do think games later in the year, uh, Heisman voters tend to tend to look at more of the late games. You know, if you're playing well late, I think that that can make up for not playing well early. As for Fournette, I, I mean, I agree with Barry that it's harder, but I think too there's there's a there's a belief among SEC people that you know he's he's the next great thing, and regardless of what happens, I think there'll be a strong SEC vote for him. Because who else are you going to vote for in the SEC? I mean, I just don't see a lot of standout super. I mean, they've got great players, obviously, but nobody's sort of made the headlines like that guy has. And, you know, you don't have a quarterback at Alabama or a quarterback at LSU or um, anything like that. So, you know, who's who's the guy that the SEC block of voters will be voting for? I think it's Fournette almost regardless of what happens down the stretch, um, just because of the dominance he's shown already throughout the season guys we've alluded to the lsu alabama game the game of the week the reason uh all the focus is not on osu at tcu and uh there was our friend les miles again uh with his subtle slight very uh not naming the opponent you said that les was up to his old tricks so i ask you barry as somebody who studied uh stoops and gundy for a long time do they have anything in their uh, bag of tricks that they do to subtly slight the opponent? You know, I, no, I don't think Gundy and Stoops do. Um, I think there's some, I think uh, people on both sides of Bedlam have some two by four stuck up their butt about the rivalry in certain ways, but not Stoops and Gundy. Gundy goes out of his way to compliment the Sooners. He even admitted last Saturday in Lubbock that he stole a formation from Oklahoma. Uh, Stoops really doesn't go that far. He doesn't give us, <clears throat> he doesn't tell us who he's stealing formations from, from anybody. But he's not, he's not loath to praise Oklahoma State if they, if they do something well. So I don't, I don't, I don't see that out of those two guys. Jenny, I always thought Stoops was uh, taking uh, a shot at OSU scheduling when he talks about East Popcorn State or East Bumblewood State. No, no, I never thought that was it. I thought he always referred to East Popcorn State when he was talking about, you know, hey, we're not uh, we're not East Popcorn State around here. It was sort of a nod to how big time they were. I always thought that was the case. Now, my favorite thing about Gundy of late is, in our opinion, where what? Of course, we know it's your opinion. You're talking. What what is this in our opinion thing? I don't know if that's a slight on anybody, but that's like his favorite catchphrase of all time so I, it almost wears me out to go to a press conference and have to wade through the in our opinions that are out there kyle you, you got it right jenny the air quotes are always a part of that equation so kyle i think that's a relatively new uh gundy thing i don't think he was doing that uh in the back in the days of yore no yeah i can't remember it's it's definitely been more of that lately and for him i think it's just more of a fail safe so you know if if People try to quote him out of context. He can say, oh, well, it, that was just my opinion. I, maybe that's what he's <laughs> thinking. It, it, more than anything, it just kind of forces me to navigate his quotes a little bit because, I mean, I, I know that, Sherm, you've even edited that out of my stories before, the in our opinion thing, because i you know, not thinking that that's kind of just wasted quote space sometimes. But, uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's all about that, man. 
sudden thought, what if we just made that a, a subhead in the uh, journal, uh, in, in our opinion, and you could just, whatever Gundy said that week, just put it in there, bullet yeah. points. If, if there was a Gundy drinking game, that would be like, yeah. drink the rest of your, your drink. <laughs> and I mean, people would be passing out by the time uh, he was about 10 minutes in. Jason, just, what about what about Stoops? Has he got any little subtle slights or uh, ticks? We know uh, we know all that in a good way and a great way, but uh, any yeah. time, anything he says to get a little dig in at the opponent? I you know, I don't that, I don't really think so. I, I haven't noticed that much from him. I um, but you know the, obviously in a, in a great way in a good way. Um, Th those sorts of things he does say. We need to maybe try to work, in our opinion, into the podcast, uh, Kyle, if we're going to use uh, podcasting in a great way. You're right. I'm, I'm going to have to do that in the next intro, no doubt. <laughs> you know what? There's one other thing that Gundy has started saying that can't possibly be 100% true. When he talks about individual guys, almost without fail, he characterizes them as guys that don't say much. But the amount of guys that don't say much in his locker room, I wonder if it's almost like a library silence in there. Because according to him, nobody says anything in that locker room. I don't quite get it, Kyle. Yeah, a team full of mutes. Who knows? It's that, weird. That's, a, that's what you need to win championships, huh? Yeesh. <laughs> Speaking of mutes, how about uh, the muted Bob Stoops was seen uh, passing down Lindsay the other day on the back of a truck. The great Bob Stoops uh, statue caper. Barry, what's what's behind all this? Solve this for solve this for us. Well, I got to admit, I don't know, but it's the funniest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> I just wish it had been me that had seen it because... Uh, that would have been wild, and I spent a considerable amount of time on Lindsay Street in Norman, so that would be uh, that would be pretty cool. Um, the funny part was not the statue. The funny part was OU's reaction. Um, Joe Castiglione was aghast <laughs> at the uh, at the, uh, at the uh, side of the uh, the uh, statue showing up in Norman, and then uh, the statement that OU released that he released. Um, made me laugh out loud that, you know, he, Joe seemed really concerned how Stoops would handle, would take this. And, you know, I, I didn't get to talk to Stoops about it. JK did, but Stoops seemed to take it a lot more serious than the rest of us, but let it slide off his back as if, I don't know what's going on either. I think Stoops was Stoops' theory, but, um, you know, the, it, it seems like something you could have some fun with. Um, you know, Stoops could have said something like, you know, I've had a few games where I've, they wanted to strap me up in the back of a truck and, <laughs> and drive me across state lines. But it's just the whole I, I, the whole idea of that you would transport something that valuable yeah. in that way. Forget that it's a statue or that it's a, a famous person statue. I mean, that didn't seem all that uh, safe for the product. I wouldn't want I wouldn't want to transfer that. From, from my house to the office, 10, 15 miles, much less. 200 miles? That yeah. seems crazy. Jason, are we 100% sure that this isn't some leftover decoration from somebody's Halloween party? Pa, are we positive? I think. Uh-oh. We lost JK. Jenny? They want to put up next oh, to Switzer and those guys. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I do think that that'd be a fun Halloween costume for somebody next year, the Bob Stoops statue. Bronze Bob. <laughs> My question is, where is it right now? I mean... It's in storage somewhere in Norman. I don't but, think any of us really know. But is there... Uh, uh, please, there's got to be a Twitter account out there for Bronze Bob at this point. I, yeah. I, I wanted to start one. Is. There I, is, but it's not that good. Somebody oh, needs to do a better one. That's disappointing. I just, I want to know what Bronze Bob, you know, is he like hanging out with, you know, leftover uh, tackling dummies now in a closet somewhere? Like, where is Bronze well, Bob? And then the other thing, one person tweeted me, they photoshopped the Bob Stoops statue and the uh, the flatbed trailer in Paris in front of the, uh, the Arc de Triomphe. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny, um, and I, I, I hope I want that to become a thing. Like, let's—I I want people to start photoshopping the stoop statue 
on the flatbed trailer in random famous places it's, in the world. That'd like be really the, funny. The gnome, the travel gnome, like popping up in all sorts of, of random spots. I I love it. Je- Jenny, it's like Ben Hickhart and the O'Brien and the and the Larry O'Brien's uh, trophy. Yeah, exactly. Traveling the country with Bob Stoops. Let's take Bronze Bob on vacation this summer. <laughs> Why not? Let's invite it to a staff meeting. <laughs> I, I this. I love it. This could be fun. Kyle, it would be fun if we could get a cardboard cutout made of Bronze Bob. That'd be fun. Why don't we ask, hey, Barry, speaking of cardboard cutouts. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> Not right now. No, right now. Okay, hey, Kyle, we'll, we'll, we'll start with you in the last question. Pretend that the Oklahoman is going to, we're going to put up a statue of you in front oh of God. the uh, building right out there. On Robinson. We're already working on that, right, with Kyle. Yeah, yeah, yeah Kyle. Okay. All right. Show it. What would show us your preferred pose, or what would it be? Oh, or or, what, or <laughs> we're trying to capture you in action. Your 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 typical place. Now Bob has a visor and he's looking pensive, as if you know when Barry says, "Hey man, maybe we could get Bob to have some fun with this." How about this, Barry? Maybe we could get Bob to have some fun. Period. <laughs> Oh, geez. What's Scoop do to anybody? He's not doing it. What did he do to anybody? He hasn't lightened up a whole lot over you know, the years, if you ask me. His, his jocularity not- making is low. Well, hey, I, I, I got a suggestion. This is kind of a dual suggestion, but how about me and uh, Jason and we're cheering, cheers uh, with Red Bulls. We're like clinking them together at the top. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I, I'd uh, be down for that. All right. We can- Good. Jason, what's your, what's your pose? Well, I was trying to go find Buster, but he won't come uh, over here. Um, but I, I, I think I'd have to like. All. I think I'd have to be holding Buster in one arm, and 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 I was gonna actually say holding a Red Bull in the other one. Yeah. Oh, boy. You know, Jason, that's a lot like the French or English monarchs. So didn't they always have their their paintings uh, done with dogs uh, or or animals? I think you'd fit right in. You uh, you got that, Jenny? What's yours? It's got to be something with a roll of the eye or a raised eyebrow, because that's how I spend most of my time in the office around you all, is with my especially, eyebrow raised or my eyes Especially rolling. when I'm talking about Buster. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, I probably asked this question wrong, uh, Jenny. What I should have done is ask you to think about what, for instance, the pose would be for various panelists. <laughs> so I'll ask you, I'll give you a bonus question. What would Barry's pose be? Oh, my gosh. I don't even know. It, I think actually, if we're doing hangout related, it would be this. Yeah. <laughs> it would be half Barry looking over the fence. We had that one day. That was pretty outstanding. So I think that go. look might be Barry's look. All right, Barry, what's yours? And then pick another person on the hangout and close us out by giving theirs. Well, Marv, you're trying to be funny, and I just don't think that's very funny. <laughs> <laughs> is that it? You don't have a pose? Oh. I'm, going, I'm going all Whitey Herzog on you. Oh. I think, Jenny, I think uh, with berries, it would be uh, as much tinting as it would be a uh, uh, pose. Remember the blueberry when he looked like he was inside oh, the yeah. metal line from the hangout? Right. Yeah. And then he looked like he was uh, coming out of the, uh, he was John Boehner coming out of the tanning bed one time. He looked orange. Or the Grizzly Adams look from uh, from oh, yeah. Columbus and Syracuse. <laughs> maybe, maybe, we, maybe we could do Barry like the uh, the three statues out front of the building right now. We could have him in ver- like a blueberry, an orange berry, and the Grizzly Adams berry all standing together. <laughs> Yes, we could. Hey, that's all for this edition of Football Friday, but you can stay with the best coverage team anywhere, every day at News OK, and every morning in the Oklahoma. Enjoy the games.